Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. This is episode 8 in our ongoing series, Unpacking the Barry Morphew Affidavit. The affidavit is 129 pages long and we are presently busy examining Barry's 15, 16 separate statements to law enforcement. In this episode, we're going to look at the March 5, 2021 statement. As usual, it's pretty interesting. Are are there any inconsistencies here? And is there anything else to highlight that stands out? Something that the prosecution could use, something that the defense could use. But before we get to today's episode, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do. Like, share, leave a comment. And let's get started. So right now we're on page 75 of 129 and we're dealing with the March 5, 2021 interview. We are almost at the one year mark into Suzanne's disappearance. In this interview, Barry asked for immunity. It's quite interesting. Feels like he is sensing that the walls are closing in, closing in on him. He asked not to get thrown in jail. He said there was no evidence. He demonstrated how he placed his phone in airplane mode, and he said that Suzanne made him a monster and things just blew up. Suzanne made him a monster and then things just blew up. And then he further explained the chipmunk and bull elk stories. Um, I could be wrong, but I seem to remember when he last spoke about airplane mode, didn't he say something about, first he said he put it in airplane mode, later on he said um, he didn't put it in airplane mode or it went into that itself, or was that referring to the alarm a little bit fuzzy on that anyway at approximately 607 a.m special agent grusing and special agent harris contacted barry morphew at the dsi facility that's 7625 west highway 50 in salida colorado the agents had an appointment with barry from the previous day to meet at 6 a.m at his residence however barry left his residence at about 5 40 a.m and pulled into the DSI lot at about 6.05 a.m. So what's quite interesting with that is you're kind of getting a scenario where they have an appointment and um, it's supposed to be at Barry's home, but then Barry um, kind of changes things at the last minute and instead pulls up to the DSI lot. So Barry says, yeah, I had a package at UPS. I had to pick up. Uh, They closed at 6, and I had to get there at 6 to come back to the gym. I didn't lie to you. Special Agent Grissing said agents were working a homicide case, meaning this is a serious investigation, and they desire to work with Barry and clear him if possible. Now, um, do you think that that is true? Do you think that the, what the agents were trying to do was clear Barry? Do you think that that was really what was going on? Barry said that's, that should have been done months ago. So even Barry is not quite convinced by that. Special Agent Grusing said the FBI's job is to collect facts, review the warrants, and Barry was the main person to explain the facts. Barry was told his cooperation was, was voluntary, and if he chose not to help explain the facts in the case, that was his decision. Barry continued, but everybody's got eyes on me. They see me talking to you. There's people seeing me talk to you right now. There's cameras right now, and it's going to get out. So you, yeah, you have Barry saying three times in this one sentence, arguably even more, this idea of eyes on him, People see me, people seeing me talking to you, there's cameras on me. And that seems to be something that is bothering him. Special Agent Grusing told Barry that him talking to the FBI should appear normal to other people and help them calm down. In other words, it should appear normal that he's assisting in the investigation into his wife's disappearance. It's funny how Barry assumes it, he assumes people are thinking the worst of him, not that they're thinking that he's doing the right thing. Special Agent Grissing told Barry that Barry's explanation of going to Garfield helped explain the missing seven miles each way from his truck, something Joe did not know in July. Now, again, if you think about that, do you think that is how they really feel, or do you think they're kind of pandering to Barry? Do you think they're kind of 
saying something that um, is going to get Barry to assume that he's in the clear. Because the other side of that was, that was also telling them uh, where Suzanne's helmet was and where he was in relation to that. Something that I don't think was particularly helpful to Barry's case. Barry talked about how speaking with the CBI was bad for him because what he told them got out in the public. Special Agent Grissing told Barry that he considers talking to agents as a bad thing. Barry was told what normally happens when a, when a, if a dad, what is it? Barry was told what normally happens if a dad is missing, a daughter or a husband missing a wife, is that they knock on the FBI door all the time. So he's kind of being reminded what is normal, it is normal to talk to the authorities. Barry says, I want to believe you want to help find my wife, find out what happened. But the things that you've told me has crushed me. It's crushed me. And uh, I don't know. That there's no way you guys can know how I feel. I went nine months thinking one thing. And then all of a sudden, you guys come to me and boom, my whole mindset is changed about this whole thing. I'm crushed. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. I don't want, I can't leave my daughter. You guys throw me in jail. I've got a 17-year-old that's on her own. You, you guys don't want that. What's interesting here is his choice of words, and it's something I picked up some months ago and I've highlighted ever since. It's the use of the word crush. And in this particular paragraph, I think he mentions it three times. He says, crushed me, it's crushed me. And then he also says, I'm crushed. And think about what that word conjures crushing what do you think that word conjures so you can think about it in a construction sense where you crush rocks you crush ground you are building something and you crush certain things and um, you change the shape of structures right that's in terms of of construction which is something Barry's involved in, the landscaping and so on. Then there's also the aspect of um, hunting. Is some crushing going on there? I suppose not really. It's a little bit different. But taking something like an antler off a deer's horn, um, that's also something where you can, to some extent, um, crush the body or... Uh, be very destructive in terms of the body of an animal, right? And then there's also um, uh, trees and wood and, and uh, forest-type scenarios. As far as I know, uh, Barry owned a forest business or something like that, a um, tree um, nursery kind of thing in Indiana. And one of the things that is, is associated with that is you've sometimes got to trim and prune those young trees and but then you've got to get rid of the branches what do you do with them well don't you put them in a wood, wood chipper right and that is the crushing of trees the crushing of tree branches and do you remember that he once said that um, the scratches that he got on his hands or on his shoulder could have been from a tree branch food for thought now we're going to page 76 Barry later said, and I know there's no evidence on me because it doesn't exist. And then he added, I'm, I'm telling you that. So he's kind of saying over and over again, there's no evidence on me. And it's quite interesting that that is where his thinking is. He's not really talking about, they're not like investigating a particular lead on a particular different person. Barry is simply just saying there's no evidence on me. Okay, so where is there any evidence, right? And uh, that is why I always say the absence of evidence is sometimes evidence, where there's absolutely no evidence. When someone disappears and there's absolutely no evidence, that in itself is suspicious. Anyway, Special Agent Grusing said, things exist that are not explained, and Barry can help with those. Barry said, you told me that if I explained them to you, you would clear me publicly. Special Agent Grissing agreed. Barry said, 
because that's what I need because this whole world is freaking they've trounced me so it feels like Barry is it's Barry against the world right special agent Grissing told Barry that talking to agents is not a bad thing Barry said it's not a bad thing for you but if something happens and I say something wrong why well, don't recall something that I told Joe this and I told you something else boom I'm done I lied Special Agent Grissing told Barry that agents would tell him when his accounts to Joe differ from current statements. So what's quite interesting is now Barry is showing or seeming to show reservations about talking to the agents. You kind of get the feeling that he's starting to feel like he shouldn't be talking to them anymore. And bear in mind, around about um, a month after this statement, he was actually arrested. He was arrested, I think, on the 5th of May. It's now the 5th of March. So um, so the whole of March would go by and then he would actually be arrested. So I think you could say that Barry's intuition was actually correct. He was right to be suspicious. He was right to be concerned. He was right to wonder what they were really thinking. So he goes on to say, Barry said, you know, you, you know, when I talked to Joe, I was frantic in my mind. I was out of my mind, even being able to talk to him like I did blows like I did blows my mind that I was able to do that because I was crushed. And I just and there he says the word crushed again. Barry said, and I gave you my gun. That's my chipmunk gun. They didn't even take it. Special Agent Grissing said the gun did not appear to have been fired for a long time. It's quite interesting. So they actually checked the ballistics on it. Barry said, yeah, it has. He added, I'm just telling you right now that if I was guilty, I wouldn't hand other weapons to you guys. Special Agent Grissing said Barry's movements that afternoon to include the truck door opening, him running from porch to porch, and Suzanne not answering texts from her lover, look different from investigators' perspectives. In a way, it's kind of a euphemism for what they're really thinking. They're saying, can you just explain this? We're not sure what it means. But they're not saying, we actually think you are guilty. We think you are, you are very, very suspicious here. They're kind of just minimizing it in their own way, saying, you know what, can you just explain this? It doesn't really mean anything, but can you provide us an explanation? Barry stated, I explained that. I mean, there's, I mean, you can ask anybody that knows me. I've, sh and then he was going to say, I've shot. And he changes that to, I've killed 85 chipmunks at my house. That's all I do. I mean, I can't sit still. I'm a worky. I'm a worker. I'm a busy bee. That's what I, I was doing that day. I'm sure he is a busy little bee. Special Agent Grissing asked Barry for permission to ask um, another question about the chipmunk thing and Barry said yeah. Special Agent Grissing said from 2.44 p.m. to 2.47 p.m. Barry is going to the porches. Barry responds mm-hmm or mm. Uh, now we go to page 77 of 129. Special Agent Grissing said at 2.47 p.m. that afternoon that's the 9th of May. Barry's phone went into airplane mode. It's quite interesting, isn't it? Barry's phone goes into airplane mode. Special Agent Grissing asked Barry if he placed the phone in airplane mode. Barry asked, I don't, where was, was it on me? Or was it on the kitchen or what? Special Agent Grissing said the phone movement was how agents knew Barry was moving around. Barry said, oh, because it was on me. Special Agent Grissing said that in the past, Suzanne tried to track Barry's phone because she thought he was having an affair. And Barry said, hmm. Special Agent Grissing said Suzanne told her friends and lover about her tracking him. Barry said, well, she's told me that. I mean, she's tracked me everywhere I went. So this is quite interesting. Yeah, you actually have confirmation that Suzanne told other people about Barry tracking her and apparently that's um, uh, I think through her phone and then Suzanne tried to do the same thing. Suzanne tried to track Barry's phone because she thought he was having an affair. So yeah, you, in a weird way you have a couple 
doing surveillance on one another and in a sense a couple um, spying on one another and in a sense in a way stalking one another. When Special Agent Grissing said Barry may have been placing his phone in airplane mode to keep from being tracked, he said, no, 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 no. I don't recall turning my phone on airplane mode. I do not recall that. So there is recall, I don't recall twice in one sentence. So what do you think about that? Him saying, I don't recall turning my phone on airplane mode. Well, how do you think the phone got onto airplane mode? So he doesn't actually have an explanation for that. It's also going into airplane mode at a critical time. Bear in mind, we've already established that at this time, Suzanne had been actively um, communicating with Jeff Libler, you know, um, 50, 60 messages in the space of two hours, ending at around about 11 minutes past two. Now, one of the things I've speculated on is that Barry arrived home and sort of spied on Suzanne sort of secretly when he arrived home. Some people have said, well, wouldn't she have heard his truck arriving? And that's quite a good point. But there's also an explanation to get to that, which which the authorities are holding back at this point. I'll tell you more about that later. The other thing is, if you look at what we just looked at, is that you don't need to be there in person to necessarily spy on someone. You can either track their phone, but there's also another way. And I'm also going to talk to you more about that as we get to another statement. In other words, you can use another system of surveillance besides the phone to actually see what someone is doing without you being there in person. And you can then play that back and get an idea of what was going on, what was being said and what someone was doing without actually being there. When Special Agent Grissing, so Special Agent Grissing further explained that Barry's phone went into airplane mode at 2.47 p.m. and came back out at 10.18 p.m. So on this particular day, this crucial day, the 9th of, of May, his phone goes into airplane mode at 2.47 p.m. And then st and, and bear in mind, this is on a Saturday. And his daughters are away from home. And it stays on airplane mode for, what is it, 10 hours. From, oh, it's a little bit less than that. From 14.47, so almost 3 p.m., right, to 10 p.m. So around about seven hours, maybe seven and a half hours, right? And Barry um, is sort of presented with this idea, did you do it um, by accident? So in other words, the agent is kind of, in a way, leading Barry by the hand saying, you know, maybe that happened by accident. Barry looked at his hand as if he was holding his cell phone and he said, yeah, it's the first thing that comes up when you hit settings. And it would, if that happened, it probably was an accident. And now, quite interestingly, in the uh, affidavit, you actually have an image of Barry. He looks, he's got quite a worried look on his face. Bear in mind the subject matter that they're talking about. Um, in terms of the prosecution, I think the subject matter is dealing with uh, the possibility of something happening to Suzanne, her possibly being murdered or attacked um, on the afternoon, Saturday afternoon, it's kind of mid afternoon. And look at Barry's face. And then in the next picture, you see him looking at his hand as if to say, here's my phone in my hand. Oh, yeah, uh, maybe I did accidentally um, uh, put it into airplane mode. Now, what's quite interesting is the defense could argue that the agents are kind of um, manipulating Barry, uh, leading him down the garden path. But imagine if you were asked you know, do you think you put your phone in airplane mode by accident? Or let's say, did you put your air, your phone in airplane mode? You'd either say yes or no, right? Yes, I did it intentionally or no, I didn't. Do you think you would say, I think I put my, my phone in airplane mode by accident? Have you done that in the past? Put your phone in airplane mode by accident? Anyway, that is what is presented to Barry and Barry accepts that. He says... Yeah, it uh, probably was an accident. Do you think it was? And then he adds, I, I don't recall that. 
He doesn't recall it happening. So how can you say, anyway, I don't know how you can say, I think it happened by accident if you don't recall it at all. Anyway, Special Agent Grusing told Barry that his truck doors were opening and closing as it backed into the middle of the driveway. Um, Barry said, I had junk in my trunk and I always have junk and I'm always taking something out, leaving my door open. I mean, I don't know that's what th that that's the case, but that's what I did. So what do you think about his truck doors opening and closing as it backed into the middle of the driveway? Do you think that's someone who is getting in or getting out while the truck is in motion? Or do you think, what do you think is going on there? Special Agent Grusing said the truck doors to include passenger so, in other words, e even the passenger doors were opening and closing until 9.52 p.m., right? So, while his phone is in airplane mode, the passenger door and the driver's door is opening and closing until late that night. Remember, he's, he called that the perfect evening. They had a, a wonderful meal and they had sex, etc. Anyway, Barry said he must have been loading a lot in his truck. Barry said to go to get ready for Broomsfield. Okay, it's actually Broomfield. Um, he said, yeah, I was putting everything in my truck for Broomsfield. I was cleaning off my workbench for just because it was a wreck. And I'm sure I was just loading for, for Broomsfield. Um, footnote 63 refers to Barry admitting on April 22nd, 2021, to the FBI that the tranquilizer was on the workbench and that it likely got thrown away in Broomfield. So he's saying the tranquilizer, I'm not quite sure if that refers to the dart or if that refers to the chemical um, or both, but I, I presume it refers to the chemical. But he's actually admitting that on the day Suzanne disappeared, that's the same day that he threw away this tranquilizer and he threw it away in Broomfield, right? The other thing that I think is just quite interesting with him referring to Broomfield as Broomsfield is you kind of get the idea that Barry's not someone who seems to pay that much attention to detail. In a weird way, is is kind of clumsy when it comes to certain kind of obvious details. Like, I'm not even from Colorado and I know it's Broomfield. And here he is living in Colorado goes to Broomfield on a job, must see the signs, and still refers to it as Broomsfield. So anyway, Special Agent Harris later explained the affair started because Suzanne needed someone to talk to. Barry asked, was it an old boyfriend? At least tell me that. And Special Agent Grusing said he was not. Barry asked, they didn't know each other in high school, which is quite a kind of a leading question. Um, it's kind of an interesting thing to say, you know, was it an old boyfriend? I would have said um, yes, it was someone from kind of high school. Then Barry says they didn't know each other in high school. And then Special Agent Grusing said Suzanne reached out to someone to talk to. Now we're on page 78 because Barry was working all the time. And Special Agent Harris said Barry was gone from Suzanne for two years in Indiana. It's quite an interesting statement to make. Barry was gone from Suzanne for two years in Indiana. Special Agent Grusing said that for Suzanne, perception was reality. For instance, when Barry put a gun to his head, he was not physically abusing her, but she felt like he was. Barry said, mentally, emotionally, I know. She said that. Now, it's quite interesting. Again, it's the same thing that came up in the Chris Watts case where they knew certain things about her that he'd now confessed to and what had happened to the children that he'd confessed to. And then they confronted him and said, what did you do to Shanann? And then, and then he said, okay, I did hurt her emotionally. That was as far as he went. Yes, I did hurt her emotionally. And yeah, you have Barry saying something similar mentally, emotionally. Yes. Um, you know, Barry adds, if I abused her in any way, it was emotionally. I got angry at times, but it was just because she accused me of these things that were just not true, that just were not true, and I had no way to prove it to her. 
She had no evidence that I ever did anything with another woman, and I haven't. Now, what's quite interesting here is you have an analogy to a potential crime. So you have the, the crime of infidelity followed by the actual crime, potentially. What I mean is, so someone thinks you're having an affair. Let's say you are having an affair, but they don't have any evidence, so you get away with it. Someone thinks you did something, they can't find anything tangible, and so you get away with it. So does that not show you that in a, another way you can do the exact same thing? You can do something, and if there's just no evidence, you can get away with it. In other words, if you tell a good story and there's no evidence, you can get away with something that you did. And I think there's a world of difference between the standards of gathering evidence from one person who's somebody that loves you and the standards of law enforcement. Anyway, she goes on, he goes on to say, I mean, you think 32 years of a lover, you could look them in the eyes and say, honey, I've never done that to you. And they would believe you, but she didn't. And I think she took that mindset with her alcohol and her pills, her depression, her and her cancer, all of this. And I think she made this monster in her head and it just blew up. So here he is blaming her for, I'm not quite sure what, is he blaming her for what he became or what became of her? So she says here, I think she made this monster in her head and it just blew up. And I, I think one can ask the same question to him. Did he think of her as a monster in, in his head and it just blew up? Special Agent Grusing asked Barry about accounting for mileage when he saw the bull elk, whether he climbed or how he turned around. Barry said, no, I just turned around. When asked where, Barry stated Garfield, probably the first place that I could turn left in. I just, I didn't go in and then turn around. I just backed in and went straight to Broomsfield. And here's another uh, image of Barry and his sort of uh, gesturing what's going on. Barry said, and I had no idea I should have told that to Joe. Then Special Agent Grusing interjected and said Joe did not know that back then. Barry said, yeah, but I didn't, I didn't keep it from him. It just didn't come in my head. Special Agent Grusing told Barry he could not, uh, he could not be a good dad. Uh, the next part's redacted because of the stress. I think it's a good dad for somebody because of the stress. So this seems to be Grusing kind of using a little bit of emotion and sentiment to keep Barry in his confidence. Barry replied, and I'm not, and it's killing her, and I just want to put it behind. I just want to start new. I just want to start over, and I, I don't know how to. I loved, and they've got their in brackets, all love, Suzanne. I don't know whether that's not clear in the audio or whether he amended that. But anyway, they say, I loved or love Suzanne. I hate what she I hate what she did to me. That breaks my heart. But I can't live like this. I can't go on like this. Special Agent Grusing said the agents do not intend to investigate this indefinitely, but Barry is the best source of information versus other people who do not know. Barry asked and what about immunity? Can you give me immunity if I sit and just open my life to you? It's quite interesting that it's almost a year after the fact, and now he's saying something like, if I tell you everything now, can you give me immunity? It, you kind of get the idea, has he opened up himself prior to this in the previous 10 or so interviews? Special Agent Grusing asked immunity for what and Barry replied I think in case somebody falsely convicts me or something Special Agent Grusing said you won't be falsely convicted it's quite an interesting statement there uh, I think it's true but I think it's quite an interesting thing to say um, it is also interesting to see where Barry's heart and mind are at this point it seems like he's starting to doubt and worry and you can say it could be paranoia but it seems like he's become more and more aware of what people know 
um, in terms of the telematics of the truck and his phone going into airplane mode and the fact that they've been able to track his movements. This information has only come out very late in the interrogation and it's obviously worrying him. The other side is there's actually additional information they still haven't told him. We haven't gotten there quite yet. Now we go to page 79. Barry was told if something bad happened, agents would argue to the DA that Suzanne had the affair and talked about antagonizing him starting May 5th. Barry asked, she actually set a date? Barry was told it was that week. Barry asked, did she actually say to him that she wanted to leave me and be with him? Special Agent Grissing confirmed and Barry replied, she actually said that? Special Agent Grissing said agents would show him the texts that she wanted to start a new life with him. Barry said he had to get to work. So it's quite interesting. What's actually happening now is the agents are confirming that they know that Suzanne uh, not only was having an affair, but she had decided that she wanted to be with Jeff, right? And what the impression one gets, obviously we don't have the original audio, but the impression one gets is that Barry is quite perturbed, upset, troubled, ruffled by this, and he and quickly the interview comes to an end. So immediately after the agents say they can actually show him the texts that she wanted to start a new life with Jeff, Barry doesn't really want to talk anymore. But Barry says, I want to get back to work. And then he asked the agents to check on his rifle scopes and tax paperwork, whether they could be returned to him. And now we're going to deal with the March 5th, 2021 interview. This is part two. And I, I, although we already had half an hour into this episode, I think it's important just to finalize March 5th. So in part two, in this interview, Barry asserted that Suzanne's phone should have been found, that he had an intuition about her affair. It's quite weird. Now he's had an intuition about her affair, whereas in the beginning he denied it and he had no idea. Anyway, he says he could not recall what he threw away on May 10th, though he was shown photos, and that Suzanne was drunk when he came home Saturday afternoon. Now, I've thought quite a lot about that, this idea that Suzanne was drunk when he came home Saturday afternoon. First of all, do you think she was drunk? Do you think she was drinking alcohol? Do you think she was under the influence of any kind of medication? I'll tell you what I think. I don't think she was. So why is Barry saying she was drunk? Well, could it be that she was nevertheless stumbling around almost like a drunk person? like someone who is about to lose consciousness. So could this statement that Suzanne was drunk when he came home Saturday afternoon, could it be true? And I don't mean drunk from alcohol. I mean drugged in some other way. What do you think? Special Agent Grissing and Special Agent Harris met with Harry at his Tailwinds worksite behind his condo in the afternoon of March 5th, 2021. So this is the second part of the interview. When Barry is told that all of the people uh, sent the Facebook request said it didn't seem like it was Suzanne sending them. So this is quite a, quite a big thing that he's presented with as well. All of the people that um, were sent friend requests from Suzanne said it didn't seem like Suzanne would do this. And this, I think, happened on the night of um, May 9th. So agents wonder if Suzanne was doing this just to make him mad. Again, I think it's they are they have an idea of what's actually going on, but they just want to get Barry's reaction. Barry said Suzanne has never done that in her life, which is quite an interesting answer. It's kind of confirming that it isn't like her. When asked if Suzanne told him she befriended these people, he said no, and then said, "But I have her phone." He says, but I have her phone. She gave me full access to her phone. She gave me the passcode. I mean, do you guys have her phone? Do you have her phone? Well, wow. so it's quite amazing that he's asking, you know, repeatedly about her phone. Um, do you remember he spoke in the past about she wanted to see his phone, but he never saw hers? 
And now, yeah, you have it in black and white, him saying, she gave me full access to her phone. She gave me the passcode, right? And now let's go to footnote number 64. It says, FBI agents asked Barry about this statement on April 22nd, 2021. And he said he did not have Suzanne's phone or passcode, just to iCloud password. Wow, that is big. That is very big. So there you have it, um, a possible way that someone monitored somebody else using the iCloud. Wow. Don't actually expect to see that here. Well, there you have it. It just shows you that this particular statement here is is really big in terms of that footnote. They would ask Barry about this um, in um, a month and a few days. Sorry, I think I said earlier uh, Barry would be arrested a month later. It's actually two months later. It's at the end of March and then at the end of April. So um, two months later he would be arrested. So this this actually came up in April, um, almost two months later, but very shortly before he was arrested, this question about having her passcode, having access to her phone. If he had access to her phone, do you think he would know who she was having an affair with? Quite a simple question. When agents tell Barry they don't have her phone, he says, nobody found her phone? And then I figured you guys had to have it. Then he then says, see, that's that, that's really weird because I thought from day one you guys had the phone. When Barry was asked where he would look for the phone, knowing where the bike and helmet were, he said in between. It's quite an interesting statement there as well. Barry talks about Suzanne's affair possibly getting out on social media. And if it does, you know darn well, you know darn good and well what everybody's going to say. I mean... I don't know if you guys think it. Barry added, but they're like, oh, Barry, Barry found out she had a boyfriend and killed her. So Barry is kind of giving the sort of obvious standard, cliched, classic scenario of um, a jealous husband, somebody finding something out and then reacting. Barry is giving that scenario. And do you think that scenario... So he's almost undermining that scenario. Do you think that scenario is relevant? Think about that scenario in terms of uh, Shanann Watts and Chris Watts. Shanann was about to find out that he had a girlfriend. And then is that why he killed her? Anyway, obviously there's more to it than that. It's not just about somebody finding out. It's also about... Um, controlling the narrative it's also about controlling big assets like homes and and money and also being able to continue with the lifestyle on your own terms anyway he continued saying i mean that's that's what people say and i'm i'm hoping that you guys believe me that i didn't know that one bit until that day you guys came to my backyard agents talk about some things related to suzanne's seven trips and her behavior in Mexico that likely made Barry suspicious, like when he wanted to see her phone because he was not a fool. Barry said, I had some intuition, but I, but I would never think it was a physical thing. It's quite interesting where Barry says he had some intuition what was happening. Well, would he really need to have intuition if he had access to her phone, if he had access to, if he had her password and he had access to the iCloud, would he, would he really even need intuition? He could just monitor what she was saying. He goes on to say, I would never think it was a physical thing. And then on page 60, uh, footnote 65, Barry refuses to tell agents in subsequent interviews how long he suspected Suzanne was having an affair. It's quite interesting. Barry was told that um, that doesn't make him guilty of her disappearance. In other words, Barry was told um, him knowing about uh, the affair doesn't make him guilty of her disappearance. And then they put here, Barry does not protest. Barry is reminded of the argument that was recorded on the pen, on the spy pen, 
and Suzanne saying it was about money and asked what that was about. Barry said it was Suzanne's grandmother's money and explained that Barry and Suzanne had borrowed $100,000 from Suzanne's dad and that it caused family problems with Suzanne's brother. Barry said Suzanne wanted to pay it back with her grandmother's money, but Barry said he made a lot of money and he would pay it back. It's quite interesting. He seems to frame this as Suzanne borrowed the money and Suzanne wanted to pay it back, uh, but Barry makes a lot of money and he would pay it back. Well, if he made a lot of money and he would pay it back, did he? So... Barry was asked about his phone pinging down by the river during the Facebook posts on Friday night and asked if he was outside. Barry said, I could have been, I don't remember. I chased critters around the house all the time. There's a bear that got in the garage. He completely destroyed my garage. And I've been looking for him ever since he came in the garage. I wasn't going to shoot him, but I was just going to scare him off. And uh, coyotes are always outside. So... He goes on to say, Barry was shown a map printout of Highway 50 near the Garfield area west of his Puma Path house and asked about where he turned around at Garfield uh, when he left his house. He asks where his road is and is told that it is off the map. It's quite interesting that all of this is done in the third person. You know, you're actually not getting the actual statements. Barry said, I can't tell you exactly where I turned around, but it was probably the first road or drive going into Garfield. Barry said the reason he was watching where the elk go is because he hunts sheds and that while the bull didn't have its horns, it was a big bull and he figured that Barry could get its pattern, then he could follow that pattern and find his horns. Barry talks about the county road where the helmet was found and said he was pretty sure he went past that one because he was still looking at the herd. Then it says here, as Barry discussed watching the herd and its patterns and where he turned around, he was motioning several times back and forth with a pen from the road to the location of Garfield Mine on the map. That's quite interesting. And there's actually a photo here of uh, Barry holding a pen in his hand above the map and he's obviously motioning while all this is going on. So obviously this is caught on some kind of camera, possibly body cam as well. Uh, but it is interesting that he seems to be motioning towards the Garfield mine in terms of where he turned around. Barry was shown a photo of the RTD stop and asked about it. Barry said he pulled over there to GPS the job site. There was a trash can right there and he just took stuff out of his truck. Barry said whatever he, was, whatever he threw uh, away was probably just sitting right there on his seat Barry said he couldn't tell agents what it was, but it wasn't worth anything. Barry says it was just junk, probably wrappers and cans. Agents labeled this as trash run number one. Now we're going to go through the others. Barry was shown a satellite image of the south side of the hotel where his truck is parked. So now eventually the agents are really playing their hand. They're showing Barry what they know, what evidence they've got of him. And um, Barry said he remembers why he was there. Barry said he was just waiting for someone to come out of the door and go in and get a free breakfast. Agents labeled this as trash run number two. Barry was shown photos from video surveillance. So I think another thing to bear in mind is Barry doesn't deny that it's him. He doesn't say, no, that's not me. Barry was shown photos from video surveillance of him carrying things, including boots, into the hotel. Barry said he doesn't even remember carrying the boots into the hotel. So that's quite interesting. So there is disputing what is seen on camera, but I think it's indisputable that it is Barry. Barry did stay at that hotel, right? And that Barry, I suppose you could dispute that that is Barry in the surveillance footage, but it certainly looks like Barry and... He was there that day, so you know, um, could you argue that it's not him? Anyway, Barry said he remembered that he took them in, into the hotel and to take the laces out. So I don't think Barry is saying that's not me in the video. I think he's just saying that those may not be boots. So one wonders what is the importance of the boots in the story. Barry said the boots had holes in them, but he wanted to save the laces. So 
uh, he took them in to take the laces out. Just see what he's saying. He was carrying boots into the hotel. Then he said he doesn't even remember carrying the boots into the hotel. So I think he's not disputing that he's carrying the boots, just that he's saying, I don't know why I was doing that. Then he said, uh, then Barry said he remembered that he took them into the hotel to take the laces out. Well, so he's got quite a weird memory. He, he cannot remember taking the boots into the hotel, but then he remembers having them there to take the laces out, which is an even more specific memory. Barry said the boots had holes in them, but he wanted to save the laces. So he took them in to take the laces out. Now we're on page 81 of the affidavit. Barry was asked about the blue the blue item he was holding and he said it looks like his swimsuit and asked if they got it from his truck. Barry was asked by agents if he remembers what was in the garbage bag. Barry said it was probably his mail. Barry was asked about changing his shirts that day and he said he did so because it was hot. So just after this reference to this is really interesting. After this reference, the reference to a blue item, there are photos of Suzanne's, I think it's Suzanne's blue, it's either cycling pants or it could be, I guess, swimming trunks. I'm not sure. But I think what they seem to be suggesting there is that he's actually carrying, um, I don't know, I don't know if cycling, because you don't see the, the color version of this, I don't know whether these are, because it looks like there's strings on there. I don't know if these those are cycling shorts or swimming shorts, but they, they look like they are fairly um, sort of nylon material. Um, whereas a man's swimming shorts are often a kind of, it's like a baggier material. Uh, so anyway, he says, uh, Barry was shown photos from, Video surveillance and asked about his McDonald's trash run. Barry said he was pushing it down because the trash was at the top and he was pushing it down so it would fit. In other words, he's not like trying to put trash into a trash can and then cover that trash up. Why would you do that? Well, potentially either because it was something that would catch your attention if you just passed by and threw the trash in. For example, if there's something uh, that was like a red... Um, substance might catch your attention or if it perhaps smelled right barry was asked what the small item was that he was throwing away and he said he couldn't remember so he can remember the shoelaces of the boots and the holes in the boots but he can't remember what this item was barry said he does this all the time and it is just him barry said i know it looks bad and it probably looked bad to joe but there's nothing there agents label this as trash run number three Barry was shown a map of men's warehouse parking lot and told that he stopped there. Agents asked if he took things to the dumpster there. Barry said, not to my knowledge. Barry was asked if he took things to a trash can and he replied, I could have. Barry was told he was there for about 40 minutes and asked if he remembered what he was doing there. Barry said, I think I was still cleaning my truck. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, I think... I just, uh, I would, I was probably getting crap out of my truck, like I said, which I've done my whole entire life. So once again, he's asked if he was somewhere, he says I could have been, and then it turns out he was there for 40 minutes. And then, anyway, they label this trash run number four. Barry was shown the photograph of the binder he's carrying into the hotel. Barry said it was papers related to the job so he could study and prepare for the job. Barry was asked about changing from a black to a grey shirt. Barry said it was because grey would reflect the sun. Or does, does grey reflect the sun? Barry said again that from what he has seen, Suzanne left and he wants to go to Mexico to find her, adding that Suzanne doesn't have to go through a border and wondered if she had $70,000. That's quite interesting. He volunteers there. I wonder if she's got $70,000. Where else do you think that $70,000 comes up? Special Agent Grissing said, if it wasn't Suzanne, the FBI would consider it. Barry said, but she turned into a different person. She was working out. She was, she was never this fit and this ballsy in her life. 
Barry said her mind was altered from drugs and alcohol. Well, couldn't her, her mind have been altered, couldn't her heart have been altered by love, by deciding to be with somebody else? He goes on to say that substances alter people's minds and that his positive Suzanne's mind was altered. Special Agent Grusing asked if her mind was altered Saturday afternoon when he came home, uh, referencing Barry's statement of her drunk eyes in the photograph. Barry said, I thought it was, but I thought, uh, I thought, I thought this might be good because it, it might make for a better night if she's cut the edge off with something. So I wasn't going to, and then he doesn't continue. Special Agent Grusing said Barry wasn't going to fight her on it. So it's quite interesting. He's not going to argue about that that night. Now, what I think is quite interesting is just the way he frames it, how the agent frames it. The agent says, um, Special Agent Grusing asked if her mind was altered Saturday afternoon when he came home. Now, what do you think? Do you think... Suzanne's mind was altered on Saturday afternoon when he came home. And that brings us to the end of the March 5th kind of double uh, interview. Uh, this is the top of page 82. Barry said, so I wasn't opposed to that that day and I surely wasn't going to bring it up. If I bring those things up, it just causes a fight. She'll start something so just let it go. So what he's kind of saying here is on that Saturday afternoon and evening, he didn't argue with her. Um, you know, previously he would bring it up and, and that time he didn't. And do you think that that is right? Do you think on that particular Saturday when she was flirting with um, Jeff, when she was saying, guess who's home alone again kind of thing, and then she disappeared shortly after that. Do you think she disappeared shortly after that because there was a fight, a confronta confrontation, a conflagration, some kind of thing taking place, some kind of incident, or because there, there was no kind of incident? Bear in mind all the things that are adding up here. There are like five trash runs. There are these strange friend requests on the same day. Um, there's Barry himself running around erratically, apparently shooting a chipmunk. There's also Barry driving around erratically afterwards when he goes to uh, Broomfield, right? Um, all of this, like, it, one of these on its own would be quite weird, but now you have all of them taking place. And even Barry seems to acknowledge that the, the bicycle and the helmet where they are are staged. So... Do you think the prosecution have a case here or do you think it's just a lot of circumstantial evidence that doesn't really take you anywhere? Well, we're going to continue with this analysis and this investigation when we deal with the March 10th interview from 2021. There is no part one. I'm not quite sure why it's not there, but we will be continuing that in the next episode, which will be episode nine. Uh, one more thing, um, I'll be doing a, I think it's, what is it, episode 10. This is a very big episode in the Van Gogh analysis, the Van Gogh series. It's the day that he actually got shot. And we're going to go through the history. And there's a lot of details regarding that incident, what time it took place, the critical question where it took place, and then also his state of mind. Did he commit suicide or did somebody shoot him? And that analysis we're going to be doing Sunday, probably around about 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, but I'll confirm that closer to the time. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you guys next time.